I want to talk about uh, research. On the other hand, um, I want to talk about managing patients and being practical and uh, sort of where we're at and where we're headed. And that's uh, the goal. So this is uh, 50 years ago. And uh, this is the last lap of a mile race 50 years ago in Canada. This guy is a doctor. He's actually a medical student, just about to finish his training. You think the uh, physician can overtake uh, the nemesis runner? Will the doctor win? Yeah, the doctor will win. Look at that. And so not only is this a doctor, this is Roger Bannister. And uh, three minutes, 58 seconds. This was shortly after that man, Roger Bannister, broke the four minute mile. First human ever to run the mile in under four minutes was 50 years ago by a medical student. And uh, this was the first time uh, he raced against his nemesis uh, face to face after, after they, they had um, eclipsed this four minute mile mark. So Roger Bannister ended up becoming a neurologist. Okay, so I'm a neurologist. He is a neurologist, still he's still alive. Um, last year he received a, a Lifetime Achievement Award from the American Academy of Neurology. He's a very famous neurologist, not because he did this, but because he was interested in exercise and energy and physiology and the autonomic nervous system. He spent his career uh, doing research in that area. He wasn't satisfied with what was known back in the 1950s about energy and exercise and physiology, so he decided to study it, which he did back in England. Um, although he is English, he got his neurology training here in the U.S. in Boston with Dr. Derek Denny Brown, and uh, then went back to England and uh, had a very uh, has had a very remarkable career. So uh, it, it points out that medical students can do great things. It points out that neurologists are all very great people, <laughs> unless they're in jail. And then uh, it points out that. Uh, there's a lot to be done about energy, exercise, physiology, function. That's what this guy was about. It's a very inspirational person. Anybody know what this is? Anybody? Beg your pardon? Yeah, it's a Belgian blue. That's correct. A Belgian blue. It's, um, I'm from Indiana, so we're really into this stuff. So <laughs> that's a Belgian blue. And so uh, what's interesting about this is this has a direct application to what's going on in research for uh, muscle disease. Okay, um, we all would like to have better, bigger, stronger muscles. No matter what makes our muscles weak, if there's a magic potion, some kind of spinach you can throw us like Popeye that make our muscles stronger and function better, we'd love to have that. And so this is very interesting. This is um, a bull that is genetically different than most other bulls. And uh, it's genetically different because it has a um, defect, if you will, of the gene that codes for something called myostatin. Myostatin. Myo means muscle. Statin means static or holding off or limiting. So myostatin actually limits your muscle growth. We all have normal myostatin. If you go find somebody in the audience, we'll have our photographer pan around. Find some big, huge, massive muscles. We might want to check that, that person's DNA. Maybe they have a, a defect of the myostatin gene that's making them grow bigger, stronger muscles. Uh, this actually has human application. There's, um, for example, a very famous child who was born with huge muscles, very strong, who has uh, this same genetic defect. He was born to two parents who were both Olympians from Germany, and uh, they both have the same defect, both of them. So he has a double dose of this gene that makes your muscles big and strong. Not sure if that's fair to be in the Olympics and have this gene defect. But uh, now people are trying to take this uh, gene problem and see if they can turn it around in a way that I could give myself uh, this gene defect and kind of um, let my muscles grow bigger and stronger. Half of all myasthenics very first symptom is either double vision or droopy eyelids and 80 percent of myasthenics after one month of symptoms they've got some degree of eye trouble double vision or droopy eyelids okay so I mean that's uh, cranial weakness very common comes and goes nothing else does that uh, there are basically three ways that one can confirm or validate this diagnosis. So let's take a show of hands. How many people um, have had their diagnosis confirmed with um, a Tensilon test, that intravenous stuff? 
Uh, you know who the first guy was that did a Tensilon test for myasthenia? And this is a very biased sort of uh, question and comment. It, uh, it's very self-serving. It's a guy from uh, my hometown named Tether. A, uh, and this fellow Tether uh, was um, a very controversial figure in myasthenia. It's estimated that about four-fifths of myasthenics respond to Tensilon, okay? But about a fifth of them don't. So some of you may have had an experience where you had a Tensilon test that didn't show anything or didn't show much. That can happen. But if you look at patients that come in from uh, 1995 uh, on, that um, more patients will have had antibody tests to confirm their diagnosis than Tensilon tests. I think it's just a test that is replacing uh, the need for a Tensilon test. And the reason is that it's easier to do than giving a shot of something in the vein. It's just easier. Um, these antibody tests are um, embarrassingly good. And we don't, I wish I ran them. I don't run them, but uh, they're amazing. They're, it turns out about 80% um, of patients that have myasthenia have these antibodies in their blood. Then if you go trying to find out um, what percent of the general population has them floating in their bloodstream normally, it's none. So you hear about tests with false positives. You ever, you ever hear about this? Like if you get tested for lupus or Lyme disease or there's a false positive, meaning it's, it's an abnormal test, but it, it, it's a mistake. It doesn't really mean anything. It's, you see, well, this test doesn't have any false positives. So it's, it's one where if, you're, if we go grab somebody off the street out there and we run this test on, if it comes back abnormal, they have myasthenia. So that's why it's a very, very good test and it's about abnormal about 80% of people with myasthenia. Now, if you have pure ocular myasthenia, and about 10% of people with myasthenia have it settled in the eyes, never goes anywhere else, um, about half of those people have these antibodies, the other half don't. And um, of the people that start off with eye trouble, uh, most of them go on to get weakness outside of the eyes, uh, but the 10% where it stays in the eyes, usually, um, if it hasn't spread by a year, it's not going to spread. So usually if people have been stable with just ocular trouble, a year down the road, that's usually as far as it goes, usually. Uh, it's interesting, about 10 to maybe 20% of people with myasthenia uh, who present with weakness, their symptoms go away with us doing nothing. Um, and sometimes we're dying to do something to these patients. We're trying to fix, should we do this with thymectomy? Should we start them on steroids? Should we do this, this, this? And by the time we figure out what to do, their symptoms go away. So I've had that happen, and, they, and it stays away. A complete, long-lasting, permanent remission can occur spontaneous. So um, sometimes the improvement that people get that's so spectacular, it's actually not from anything I've done. So when I put somebody on a drug and they get better, it doesn't have to be from the drug I give them. It could be just the natural course of disease because 10 to 20% of the time, the thing just gets better on its own.